Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We're glad you all can come today. Right now, we're going to have a few marks from uh, Mayor Carpenter. Mayor Carpenter? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Phyllis. I almost sat down. <laughs> um, this is uh, a distinct honor for me to be back this year. I think this is the fourth year of the event, and um, I think the mission is just as critical tonight as it, as it was when this campaign began. Um, I guess I come at it from the perspective of being a male who's probably right in the prime age to, uh, to be a target of prostate cancer. And I just want to thank so much all the partners, NAACP, Good Sam, AdmiTech, uh, for partnering on this just critically important campaign. Um, and as much as I know I'm in higher risk than people in other age groups, you know, the fact of the matter is that men of color my age are even far more at risk than I am. And that's the reality. And that's why this is such a critical, critical drive to make sure that we just convince everyone to realize what the risk is, to um, make sure that they are uh, religiously taking the steps to be monitored, checked, screened every year, um, because that saves lives. And I just, and maybe because I'm in the age group of all my friends now, um, but this is like an epidemic. I mean, I. I so many people that are close to me are, are struggling with this and fighting this right now. So this has really hit very close to home for me. And uh, that's why it was so important that I wanted to be here to show my support to the partners in this drive. So um, I appreciate everyone that's here tonight. Uh, we need to continue to grow this movement, to spread the word, to create the awareness, uh, and to make sure that we, we don't lose anybody else. Thank you. We will now have a welcome from one of the partners at Good Samaritan Medical Center, Dr. Jason Zolls. So welcome. I'd like to thank Mayor Carpenter for attending and coming today, as well as welcoming all of you again to another one of these events. Um, I think this is probably about my third time uh, being here, and uh, I appreciate uh, Dr. Stern for inviting me back um, over the last several years. Um, basically, you know, Good Samaritan, um, just to kind of who we are, a little plug, a shameless plug for Good Samaritan. Um, Good Samaritan has been trying to become the premier regional choice for care in the, in the city of Brockton and the greater uh, South Shore region. Um, over the past couple of years, the hospital has been able to build up the only level three trauma center um, in the South Shore which is a phenomenal achievement over the last couple of years and it's been uh, very uh, well um, represented in the community. Um, one of the joint commission accredited, only joint co commission accredited orthopedic center of excellence for knee and hip replacement in the area. We have uh, the only hospital offering robotic surgeries um, in this area with over seven specialists trained in robotic surgery as one of the uh, country's, I think, top 10 most recently 2,000th robotic surgery um, in the, here at Good Samaritan. So we have a very vigorous program. Um, cancer program here, I've been here for a long time. I've been here for six years. We have one of the largest um, oncology practices in the area with uh, six uh, oncologists on staff here. Um, as far as radiation oncology, what I do, we have, the, I believe, the only stereotactic body radiation therapy treatment program in the area. Um, we've been doing it for the last four or five years. Um, we're also here for a long time and being a proud sponsor of the AdmiTech as well as the NAACP. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Stern for all what she's done for the community um, as well as prostate cancer awareness. She's been a, a great ambassador to, to this all. Um, and basically, I'd like to thank you in joining me and welcoming your MC again, um, the president of the NAACP, uh, Phyllis Ellis. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to move the uh, program around a little bit. Uh, right now, we're going to have a cancer, prostate cancer survivor, Darren Durate. He's going to come up here and talk. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and I'd like to thank the uh, NAACP for having events 
like this one and events in the past. I want to thank the healthcare professionals from Good Sam and Stewart for being here also. I just want to say I never thought I would be standing here before you to tell you my story. And if my story can help just one of you, then I think we can chalk this up as a success. I came to these events oftentimes hearing about prostate cancer. Did I really do anything about it? No, I didn't. 2016, though, I came but, and I heard about it. I talked to the people here at Good Sam. Again, I did little about it. 2017, I came to one of these events. We had it a perfect place, right at your spot. And I talked to some of the doctors here. And they were trying to get all of us to go to a prostate cancer event on Beacon Hill. I said to myself, that particular date, I knew I couldn't make it. But I said, I'd go to the doctor and get checked for myself. Soon after that date, a cousin of mine was diagnosed with the disease. I went and got checked immediately. Soon after that, I went to the doctor. My doctor said, you know, your PSA level is down, then it, you know, down from where it was two years ago. That was a good sign. But after talking with my cousin and friends of the family who have experienced with this disease, I realized I was still at risk. So I went back to the doctor and we decided to have a biopsy. So we had the biopsy and the results were shocking, not only to me but to the doctor as well. Not only did I have prostate cancer, I had an aggressive form of prostate cancer. The doctor said, if you let this go, you might not be around for the next three to five years. I didn't feel sick. How could this be? I didn't feel any symptoms. Everything was the same, aside from being a lot heavier than I used to be. <laughs> but other than that, I didn't feel any symptoms. So the healthcare team uh, who was the surgeon, Dr. Ingolf Turk, who was with Stewart Healthcare, who couldn't be here today, who was going to be here. We decided to act fast because the cancer was on the move and it was moving to the edge of the prostate, which would mean if it left and went to other places in the body, then we have an e even more serious problem. So we acted fast, got the prostate out nine weeks ago. And we're happy to report that the pathology report shows that there's no more cancer left in the body as of now. Thank you, thank you. And I just I want to thank the healthcare team at Stewart Healthcare. I want to take my family. I want to take friend, thank friends of my family who have known about this disease. And I want to thank the NAACP who had these events. And I want to say to people. You know, when sometimes we think about, oh, this can't happen to me. This can't happen to me. I, I thought that. I used to hang around with, uh, years back with, I don't know if some of you remember WBZ TV's Charles Austin. He was an African-American reporter, one of the first ones we had in Boston. I brought him down to Brockton to, to speak at a BAMSI event. I used to be on the board of directors for BAMSI. Um, and he was preaching, make sure you get your PSA checked. At that time, I was in my 30s. I wasn't really thinking about it. Uh, but you know what? Some of us may not even realize that our family has a history of prostate cancer. Like I said to myself, my father, he died of a heart attack. Did he have prostate cancer? I have no idea. Because A, he didn't tell us, and B, he probably never got checked. So please, do your homework. Get your PSA checked. It's that important. And make sure you know your results and question your doctor about the results because you want to get a biopsy to find out whether or not you have cancer or not. My friends, my family, and I are grateful that my life has been spared. And I want to thank uh, the people who've helped me along the way. I want to thank God. And I want to say to each and every one of you who are here, if you know someone who you think's at risk, even if you don't think, because I didn't think I was at risk. I'll be honest with you, I didn't. But you never know. It doesn't hurt to get a test to find out. God bless each and every one of you, and thank you. Okay.
you, Darren. Now for my welcoming. Good evening. My name is Phyllis Ellis. I'm the president of the Brockton Area Branch in ACP. And on behalf of the branch, I would like to welcome you to our program. I would like to thank our host and one of our partners, Good, Med Good Samaritan Medical Center, and the leadership of Dr. Jason Zalls and Dr. Um, McArdle for hosting this event here at the Moakley Center. To our distinguished guests, Mayor Carpenter, Senator Brady, Representative Claire Cronin and Jerry Cassidy, Sidney Marrow and the Marrow family, the members of the Brockton branch, friends, members of the community, welcome. The Brockton area branch partnered with Admitech Foundation and Good Samaritan Medical Center about three years ago. The reason for the partnership is to bring prostate cancer awareness to the city of Brockton. Why? Because studies have shown that the African American men have a mortality rate of 2.5 times higher than those of white men. Why such disparities? So we invited you here today for a free informational session about prostate health. You will learn about approaches to prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of prostate cancer and benign conditions from our expert leaders like Dr. Jason Zalls, medical director here at Good Samaritan, Dr. Richard McArdle, a urologist here at Good Samaritan, and Dr. Faye Stern, president of Admitech Foundation. You will also hear from can prostate cancer survivors. You already heard from Darren. It is our hope that you will leave here with a very <laughs> knowledgeable information. Our program today is dedicated to Harold Bomero, a past vice president of the Brockton area branch in ACP, who lost his battle to prostate cancer last month. I did not have the pleasure of knowing Bo as long as many of you did, but I found him to be a generous person, a person with a quiet soul, a perfect gentleman. He will be missed by all. Our program at this time I would like to recognize our partners for this event. Good Samaritan, Nikki Graves. <laughs> From Ambi Tech, Dr. Stern. Christine Grongberg. Santina Russell. And from the Brockton branch team, Steve Bernard. Leona Martin. And Janet Trask. At this time, we'll have Steve Bernard come up. Thank you, Phyllis. I'm sure you all know by now that Phyllis is a wonderful leader of our, of our NAACP Brockton branch. We're glad to, glad to have her and hope that she'll be with us for, for many years. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to stand before you tonight and to dedicate this evening's program to the memory of Harold Bo Merrill. Harold's, uh, as he would be insulted if we didn't call him Bo. <laughs> His wife is here with us tonight, Sidney Merrill. His brother and best friend, Eugene Jean Marrow. And I personally want to say that I really love the Marrow family, as so many people in Brockton do. And he has a table of very close friends uh, with him here, with them there this evening. But I want to share some personal words. And for that, I have to put on my glasses so I can. Thank you for so I can read my own words, so I can find my glasses. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Dedication in memory of Bo, entitled, Come to the Edge. September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Today, September 27th, is Prostate Cancer Awareness Day in Brockton. We are pleased to observe Prostate Cancer Awareness Day with you this evening, all of you. We dedicate this event in the memory of, Bo of Harold C. Bo Marrow, Jr. 
many people don't know and will hear for the first time that his middle name was Curtis, as shared with, with me from a very close friend. Bo died on Wednesday, August 22nd, after a long and courageous battle with prostate cancer. Bo lived with us, and Bo lived for us. Much of our life is spent in pursuit, in pursuit of God, in pursuit of truth, in pursuit of happiness. I believe that Bo had a personal relationship with the Heavenly Father, with single-mindedness, clarity, and commitment. I believe that Bo found truth to be self-evident and unquestionable, axiomatic. I believe that Bo lived his life in a way that made him happy. Now, I also believe that Bo may have adopted the sentiment of the poet who said, now and then, it's good to pause in our pursuit of happiness and just be happy. More important than pursuing happiness or just being happy, J.D. Salinger once said, happiness is an attitude to life as a whole, while joy lives in the moment. Happiness is a solid, joy is a liquid. Happiness, happiness is something you pursue, but joy is not. It discovers you. It has to do with a sense of connection to other people or to God. It comes from a different realm than happiness. It is a social emotion. It is the exhilaration we feel when we merge with others. It is the redemption of solitude. I believe that joy discovered Bo. Bo's family and friends describe him as loving, caring, protective, encouraging, kind, supportive, friendly, fun-loving, gentle, honest, respectful, suave, debonair, and buffed. When doctors diagnosed Bo's illness and gave him only a few months to live, Bo fought the good fight for more than a year. Today is Prostate Cancer Awareness Day. We are taking on prostate cancer. The challenge is daunting, our hearts are strong, our spirits are steadfast. We have come to the edge. Come to the edge, he said. We can't, we're afraid, they responded. Come to the edge, he said. We can't, we will fall, they, re they responded. Come to the edge, he said. And so they came and he pushed them, and they flew. In remembrance of Bo Marrow, what we learn and share here this evening will empower us to take the next step in our effort to stem the crisis of prostate cancer. We are inspired by the life of Bo Marrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. It is my honor to read this proclamation, but I too have to put my glasses on. Proclamation. Whereas Good Samaritan Medical Center is committed to the health and well-being of the community which it serves and expresses that commitment through its partnership and organizations and individuals who share tenets of similar mission. And whereas Good, Samarit Good, Samarit Good Samaritan Medical Center has made a commitment to the community, co collaboration to the fight against prostate cancer with partners at Metech Foundation and the Brockton Area Branch NAACP. And whereas, Harold Bomero, also being dedicated to wellness of members of the community by emphasizing social responsibility exemplified by his long-standing membership to the NAACP. And whereas, Bo Marrow, having demonstrated his commitment to the health and well-being of others through his efforts as a counselor within the correctional department, as a mentor to local high school students, and as an avid fan of the Brockton Youth Sports and Arts Program. And whereas, Bo Marrow, having recently lost his battle with prostate cancer while maintaining bravery, love, and admiration for his family and friends, 
and establishing the Merrill Family Scholarship Fund at Bridgewater State University. And whereas Bo Merrill, having established a legacy of kindness, compassion, generosity, and quiet heroism. Now, therefore, we, the Prostate Cancer Community Coalition, comprised of Good Samaritan Mer Medical Center, Admitech Foundation, and Brockton Area Branch of NAACP, do hereby grant this tremendous honor of dedicating this evening of prostate cancer awareness to the family of Harold Bomero. With our unending admiration, our deepest sympathies, and our most resounding echo of respect, sign the 27th day of September in the year 2018. Good Samaritan Medical Center, Admitech Foundation, and the Brockton Area Branch in AACP. Sydney, please come take your proclamation. family I just want to say thank you very much I know he's smiling down at all of us right now and uh, and he appreciates this very very much take care everyone God bless you. thank you at this time we have the proclamation from the Massachusetts General Court Dr. Stern would you introduce Um, there, are very uh, there, there are very special three people who will be in front of you in a couple of moments. We saw a deeply moving story of uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mero. We are here today. We are working with Good Samaritan <laughs> and with uh, uh, Brockton Area uh, um, branch of NAACP to make sure that Brockton will no longer have such grave losses as, as the loss we are discussing today. And this work is made possible, empowered, supported, and championed by the people that is great pleasure for me to introduce today. Uh, Senator Michael Brady. Thank you. Representative Claire Cronin. Representative Jerry Cassidy. We would not have been able to make an impact for Darren. We will not have been able to make an impact for, for Victor. You just, you will hear in a few moments. Without support and leadership of Brockton delegation to the State House. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, Darren, congratulations. And, and you, you are part of the City of Champions, and that's why you didn't give up the fight. And God bless you. Thank You're you still know. with us. So. Um, and be, before I give this presentation, I also want to thank Madam President, which sounds like a good thing, Madam President, we <laughs> someday, <laughs> but Phyllis and, and Steve, uh, you got us involved, and Dr. Stern with Admi Tech, you got our delegation involved with this endeavor, and it's very important, and very important to bring attention. Both my parents had cancer, not prostate cancer, but I get to get checked for certain things, and it's a thing that you, none of us want to talk about because of the insecurity or whatever, we're all shy about talking about things, but we have to talk about it and bring attention. And, and it's a great endeavor to bring attention to our community that we represent because it's so important. And Darren is a perfect example of that. So thank you to all the work you've done bringing attention to us and also advocating at the State House because we can't do our job without everyone in this room and your advocacy and especially the group that I mentioned because without your input and advocacy, we don't get the legislation and the work done at the State House and there's great support in this community. So thank you for all you do on that. And to the family of Bo and uh, Gene, you, you couldn't have read better words at his, his service. 
Um, you hit it right on the head, and uh, you talked about bold, like in fast cars, and then you pause because we know, like all of us, we like other things in life, and then you pause and, and Bo liked fast cars. And it was a perfect sentiment. And, and we looked up to Bo as an older person, like the cool one. But he was also a very good-hearted person. And later on, he mentored to many youth in this community. And he, he was a great mentor to many of us sports, but other children who need a little direction in life. And he helped them get on the right path. So thank you for that, and thank you to the Merrill family. So this official citation to be a known that the Massachusetts Senate hereby extends its congratulations to the family of Harold Bo Curtis Mao Jr. for his service to his country as a veteran of the United States Air Force, his passionate contributions to Brockton High School, and his strong commitment to higher education. Uh, would you mind coming up and we'll present this to you? And why don't you, because I know the house has it, so why don't you come over here and we'll all do it at once, so. <laughs> this is from the Senate, but we'll, we'll let our rep colleagues, and, and we're very fortunate. We don't get the job done with one of us. We work as a great team, and Representative Claire Crona and Jerry Cass and Michelle Dubois, we have a great team at the State House. But as I mentioned, I'm very sincere about this. We don't do our jo job alone without everyone in this room and your input helping us do our job, so thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, on behalf of the House of Representatives, I'm here also with my colleague, Representative Jerry Cassidy, uh, who I will also have to give a little shout out to here, uh, because every year, uh, Jerry is the lead sponsor of the Prostate Cancer Awareness amendment to the House budget. Uh, that was first brought to us by Dr. Stern and Steve Bernard and Phyllis, and every year Jerry takes the lead on that. Uh, so I just want to point that out, and thanks Jerry for doing that. Uh, and on behalf of the House of Representatives, I will read the proclamation uh, that we are giving to the family of Bo Marrow in recognition of his service to his country as a veteran of the U.S. Air Force, his passionate contributions to Brockton High School, and his strong commitment to higher education. And it is signed by uh, Jerry Cassidy, myself, and the Speaker of the House, Robert DeLeo. So, thank you. I just wanted to say one thing. Um, um, if I don't do a good job, Gene Merrow, he was my coach. He's going to make me run laps around the building. So, coach, please, I hope I do a good job. But uh, uh, Dr. Stern and uh, Steve Bernard, they were they've been fighting for this for years, and uh, they're in my office today, and uh, they gave me a little uh, little uh, uh, language change. So I said I promised to go up to Ways and Means, which I did, and uh, you know, on, on uh, fighting on behalf of. Uh, you know, Admitech and uh, NAACP here in Brockton. I uh, went to Ways and Means, and they were they were fairly good with it. So I went up to uh, one of our other colleagues, the leader, and the speaker's office. So know that I am fighting, you know, on behalf of my delegation for you guys uh, to uh, get rid of this uh, dreaded disease. And it's uh, uh, just to let you know, I'm I'm there for you, always. Thank you. We've heard from Darren, and now we're going to. We have another citation from Mayor Carpenter. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, you know, Bo was a friend to me, I think, as he was to probably just about every single person in this room. So I don't think there could be a any more appropriate person to be recognized uh, with this program tonight than Bo. And, uh, you know, Bo was someone that I greatly liked and also someone that I greatly admired. 
you know, a man who served his country in his first career, served his fellow man in his second career, and served the city of champions his entire life, and always gave back to the city and served many, many years on the Parks and Recreation Commission. And uh, I was uh, very honored when he agreed to accept my appointment to the License Commission, uh, and he continued to serve. Uh, so we are uh, all just greatly diminished by his loss, but I would like to also present Sydney with a citation from the city. Be it known that the Mayor of Brockton hereby extends his appreciation to the family of Harold Bo Marrow, Jr. in recognition of his service to the City of Champions. From his time serving our country in the United States Air Force to his time contributing to Brockton High School, Bo Marrow, Jr. truly exemplified what it is to be a champion in the city of champions. His influence and spirit will live on within our city forever. So therefore, it gives me great pleasure to present this citation as a symbol of our appreciation. And I've duly signed this uh, citation today as the mayor of the city of Brockton. And I'd like to present this to Sydney and the family. Thank you, Mayor Carpenter. We've heard from Darren. We now have another prostate cancer survivor, Mr. Victor McKean. Good evening, everyone. My name is Victor McKen, and I am a prostate cancer survivor. Just wanted to uh, make sure that I let you know that you know, once you start getting checked for prostate cancer, and they tell you so about an acronym called PSA, you need to understand what that means and your, your prostate-specific antigen and what happens when that goes to a, a, past a certain threshold, uh, what does that, does that mean? And I believe, as an engineer, that knowledge is power. And when I was first uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer, I was in a tailspin because I didn't know what to do. I didn't even know what to talk to. Uh, my primary care physician immediately gave me a referral to a, a urologist, and the urologist wanted to do a, a biopsy. And um, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> what a biopsy? and right there in his office. And so I wanted to get more information, and I didn't even know who to talk to. And I, I was talking to uh, one of the friends of the family who was um, a friend of Dr. Faina Stern, and he said, well, I know just the person you need to talk to. You need to talk to Dr. Stern. Mm -hmm. So I called her, and she interviewed me all over the phone, and I was like, who is this lady asking me all these personal <laughs> questions? <laughs> but you know what? You have to get past that, that fear and that um, uncomfortableness of um, having somebody ask you those very personal questions because it can save your life. You know, as a black male living here in the United States, um, we understand that <coughs> prostate cancer disproportionately affects people of color, especially Latino and African American men, men of African descent. So um, part of the interview that Dr. Stern gave me was she asked me, would you be willing to be part of a clinical trial down in um, Bethesda, Maryland? And I had to come up with the expenses to get down there on my own. However, what a tremendous opportunity to be part of a clinical trial where they were doing leading edge technology on the, the fusion um, MRI biopsy and what that means is they take an MRI of your, your body, your prostate, and then they overlay that when they do the biopsies, and they use certain algorithms to determine where the most probability of cancer could be. And that's when they do the biopsy, that's where they target, versus just having what they call um, 
you know, blind biopsy where they just go and take 12 samples from anywhere in the gland. So look at that. Knowledge is power, right? So I never knew that there was such a thing as a, a fusion-based MRI um, biopsy. But being associated with Dr. Stern, you're now having an opportunity to hear it from me. You can ask for these uh, different treatments. I'm currently under what's called active surveillance right now. And um, since 2013, I've been going back to the NIH to uh, get biopsies. And um, I've had three of them so far. I'm scheduled to have one next year. If there's anybody out there that wants to know more information, please don't feel uncomfortable coming to talk to me. Use me as a resource. What I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. I'll direct you to Dr. Stern. But I just wanted to share with you that this is really important. You need to become an ambassador for prostate cancer awareness. If you've got family members, if you've got friends, if you've got coworkers, I just recently found out that a coworker of mine just had his prostate removed. So this is, this is serious. And we would like for you to, to understand that, that if you get it identified early, then there's hope that we can do something as far as treatment for you. So I wanted to share that with you this evening. Thank you for this opportunity. And I do live here in Brockton. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Victor. At this time, we will have a presentation by Dr. Richard McArdle, who's a urologist here at Good Samaritan, on the state of the art in prostate cancer care. Thank you. Yep. Good evening, folks. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending. This is very important, especially during Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. I'd like to thank Dr. Stern and AdmiTech and Good Samaritan, and especially the uh, NAACP for allowing me to say a few words. As you know, prostate cancer is very serious. It is the second most common cancer in men. It's, there's roughly 250 to 300,000 new cases diagnosed every year, and unfortunately, between 40 and 50,000 deaths. So it's very serious. Also, especially in, in this community, as you are aware, the mortality rate in Afri African American males is two and a half times the general population. So about 1.6 in Hispanics. So it's definitely a genetic disease, and there's been numerous studies which show that people who, of West African ancestry have a much higher incidence of prostate cancer. And especially in the black community, uh, the cancer, when it's diagnosed, is usually more aggressive, and it's usually diagnosed at an earlier age. So it's very important for people who are at risk to be checked. And who's at risk? In the general population, it's anybody over the age 50, anybody who has an immediate relative, like a father, brother, or uncle who had prostate cancer, and obviously people of Afri African-American ancestry. Now. What does that mean? It means that people should be checked, and we should go and tell our neighbors and our friends all to be checked, or screened, as they call it. What does that mean? It means just two things. One, that you see your doctor, and you have initially a digital rectal examination. It's where the doctor, unfortunately, puts his finger in your rectum and tries to feel the prostate. He's looking for any inconsistency, any hardness, any firmness, any lumps that might point to a possible prostate cancer. Unfortunately, the exam is only about 20%, 25% predictive of cancer, but it's the first step. We then go to the blood test that was already alluded to, the prosthetic-specific antigen, PSA for short. PSA is a, a protein enzyme released by prostate cells. Its sole function appears to be the liquefaction of sperm. However, it has been noted that as the PSA number rises, the incidence of prostate cancer increases. Now, we used to think that the normal values for PSA were zero to four. Uh, however, if you look at most studies, most men who have a PSA, uh, most men have a PSA less than one. People who have a PSA between one and three, they probably have about a 15% chance of having prostate cancer. 
And then, obviously, as it keeps going up, the incidence increases. As a rule of thumb, in general practice, we used to recommend a biopsy if a PSA was over 4. Now, unfortunately, the PSA is not absolutely accurate, and that led to some problems in, in the care of, uh, of patients. As you're probably aware, PSA was, was uh, approved by the FDA in about, in about 1986. And when everybody started testing, the numbers are up, it led to more biopsies, and it led to more diagnosis of prostate cancer. Actually, the incidence in the, neck, in the 10 years after PSA came on the market was probably doubled. But by the late 1990s, it was obvious that a lot of people were either having complications from the biopsies or they were overly uh, aggressively being treated for cancer that might or might not uh, cause them any difficulty. And so the, I remember there was sort of a landmark study by the American Academy of Family Practitioners in the early 2000s, which said, said that PSA should not be advocated, that they should not there should not be routine screening. Well, of course, what happened is that more people uh, had late stage prostate cancer and more people uh, eventually died. And so uh, it wasn't until probably about 2008 or 2009 where two studies came out which stated that there was probably a 20% reduction in, in mortality rates if a patients were screened. And that's logical, that makes sense. If you can pick up a tumor earlier, then the treatment can be started earlier, and therefore, hopefully, the, the cure rates will be higher. And that appears to be the case. So we advocate that everybody has uh, a rectal examination and a um, PSA level, um, especially if they're at high risk. And that simply means over 50, a relative or an Afri African American male. Now, if a person does have a, an elevated PSA, as I stated before, it doesn't mean that they have cancer. A lot of things can cause the, the test to be elevated. For example, enlargement of the prostate, infection of the prostate, trauma to the prostate, all can cause a rise in the PSA level. Um, as Victor stated, uh, his PSA actually had gone down over time. Well, why can it go down? Well, it can go down simply, maybe you're not having as much coffee, or maybe you're not drinking as much. Um, maybe your prostate has shrunk. It's variable. But the point is, if you stay in the system and see your doctor on a regular basis, you'll have some idea. Now, say it's, your PSA is elevated and you decide to have a biopsy. Well, a biopsy is usually done in the office. And if the biopsy is positive, it still does not mean that you actually need active treatment. As Victor said, he's on active surveillance. It all depends on what's found. If there's a large volume of tumor demonstrated on biopsy, that, that sort of points to a, a worsening of the disease. If, the, if the, what they call the grade of the tumor on the biopsy is higher, then that also indicates a, sort, a cert, certain level of aggressiveness. The PSA, um, I mean, sorry, the biopsies are graded on a scale of two to ten. If you have a, a score, a score of say six or less, it's probably a type of tumor that's never going to bother you, and and probably does not need to be treated. Although they can change over time, and that's why you have to be surveilled. Whereas if the P, if the biopsy showed a very aggressive tumor, say a say a Gleason grade eight or nine, well, those patients definitely should be treated simply because they are more likely to go on more quickly to advance disease and also make the disease much more difficult to treat. So say we eventually nowadays, if you get to a positive biopsy and it's one that has to be treated, does it mean you need surgery? No. First, surgery is usually recommended for younger people who have a higher Gleason grade and a larger volume of disease. Also because they have longer, uh, many more years to live, so if you can theoretically remove all the, all the disease, they do much better in the long run. However, there are many options, especially in surgery, there's open, old-fashioned surgery or there's robotic surgery, as uh, 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 
Mr. Dwati mentioned he, he had with, with Dr. Turk. The, um, or you can choose some type of radiation therapy, and Dr. Zoltz will talk about that. There's usually two types. You can put seeds in the prostate, or you can give extra, uh, external beam radiation. You can also freeze the prostate. You can also do high-intensity uh, high focused ultrasound of the prostate. Each one of these other modalities has the benefits in, in their drawbacks. But basically, if you were going to be treated, it's either surgery or radiation therapy. And as I'm sure Dr. Salas will tell, uh, tell you, recent studies basically show there's no significant long-term difference in cure rates between the two modalities. And indeed, maybe the quality of life issues are a little bit better with radiation therapy. Can you stop that on camera? I was going to say, as a surgeon, I hate to say that, but, but that's true. But, the, the point is, it's a disease that can be, that can be treated. It's a, it's a disease that can be cured. Not everybody's cured, even with really good surgical data. A third of the patients still recur. However, usually at that time, the disease is, is a lower volume. And the other adjuvant treatments that we can use, usually hormonal therapy or some type of chemotherapy, can keep the disease under control for many years. Um, having been in practice for a long time, I still remember a patient who was 55 and I thought he had disease confined to his prostate and I went to operate to remove his prostate and at the time I found that he had big involved lymph nodes. That would indicate that the disease was already outside the, pro outside the prostate. And usually the life expectancy at that point is not very good. However, at that time we put him on hormonal therapy and I treated him for about 25 years. Uh, and so prostate cancer is somewhat unpredictable uh, and people can live a long time with, with uh, even se severe disease. But the whole idea, at least in medicine, is you want to diagnose it early, you want to treat it for cure, and then be done with it. And that's the importance of screening. And so as we all go out into the community, please mention to your friends or relatives, especially if they're in the, you know, the high risk groups, just go to your doctor. It's easy. Get it checked. And then you can have a discussion with him and decide between the two of you about how you want to be treated. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Is there a, a list of probable symptoms? Well, unfortunately, the, the initial symptoms are, uh, are, are negative. I mean, most people do not have symptoms. Oftentimes, the first thing you, you will get uh, is people having traditional prostate symptoms, slowing of the stream, hesitancy, maybe having to get up more often at night. But as a rule, we would say that there is no symptoms at all. And I can tell you, at least with regards to the PSA, because people have poo-pooed PSA at some time during my career. When I started in the 70s, we didn't have the PSA. And I can tell you about 85% of the patients I saw in diagnosed prostate cancer, the disease was already spread outside the prostate. And yeah, you could treat them with, with adjuvant therapy, but oftentimes they would die terrible deaths. And whereas now, since the advent of the PSA, 85% of the patients who are diagnosed, it's confined to the prostate, and only about 15% are, are, out, are outside. That's sort of the, the rough numbers, but that's, that's why it's so important to be, to be cured. And just like in, with tumors in any kind of disease, if you can treat the primary tumor and decrease the volume of that tumor, even if you can't cure it, you can definitely extend the lifetime of the patients. Okay, it's just sort of simple math. Okay. Yes, sir. I will always ask uh, if there was a possibility that, uh, you know, uh, young men of African descent uh, could be taught early, you know, what to look out for. For example, we have Brighton High here where you, know, you see a large number of, uh, of, of boys. Uh, you know, I was wondering if, you know, with the knowledge you have, if, you know, there could be a situation where you could at least go and kind of heighten the awareness. Because at early age, yeah. once they know that, then they're more predisposed to kind of yeah, uh, that would be ideal, but unfortunately, you know, when you're 20 or 30, uh, you, you, you don't think about death, you don't think about disease, 
and it's our, you know, the official recommendation is that if you had a family member age 40, you should be screened. If it's if you're African American, it's around 45, you should be screened, and for everybody else, age 50. But uh, I think the only way people can be aware about it is functions like this, or posters that they see in the hall, uh, or you know, something on the on the computer. Um, it's the only way. Yes, ma'am. Are you so? Am I to understand you? The, the there is a tumor in the prostate. That is what causes the tumor. Is what causes the cancer. Yeah. Well, well, I use the term tumor and cancer oftentimes interchangeable. It's a mass okay. in the prostate. Okay. Technically, it's usually what they call an adenocarcinoma. That's what the pathologist will, will read it out as. Um, but it is a cancer, it, it's a mass, it's a tumor, all, all synonymous with each other. Okay, and, 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 it's, and a lot of African American males have this particular... You, you're more statistically, more statistically more at risk. At risk for this. Yes. Yeah. Again, it's genetic. For example, for example in <coughs> Japan, which has a homogeneous population, they have almost no prostate cancer. They might have stomach cancer, but they don't have prostate cancer. But people of, Af of West African origin, whether they're there or, or have ancestry to here, have a much higher incidence of, of, of prostate cancer. Does sexuality have anything to do with I no. mean, how frequently you no. utilize your body? No, they, they used to think that higher, higher testosterone levels, okay, and things like that made a difference. It does not. Oh, okay. It does not. <laughs> yes, yes ma'am. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. We um, talked a lot about the mammogram because one of the reasons why gentlemen often don't get a prostate disease is because the stigma associated with the finger stick. Mm -hmm. But I heard you talk about it. Is someone going to talk about a quote unquote mammogram uh, this evening? Um, I don't know. Mammogram? Mammogram. A mammogram. Something like you're doing, you're doing an ultrasound over is different from the finger stick. Ah. I, I've heard a lot about it for our campaign. Okay. So I don't think I know what I'm talking about. Okay. Anymore. First, an, a pure abdominal ultrasound of the prostate is not very good. It would not pick up any suspicious areas. A transrectal ultrasound, which is usually a probe inserted into the rectum instead of the finger, but it shows the prostate on a screen. That's what we use to guide our needle biopsies when we're when we're going to do a biopsy. However, to I'm sorry? That's the, 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 the probe that's placed in the rectum. However, we would not do that um, just to look because it's not that reliable. Well, the other thing that um, I'd like to see happen, um, Dr. Stern, I'd like you to hear this. 70% of the women make the decisions in the family and it's really based on health within the family structure. It, it, it's, it's true. Yeah. Seriously, it's, it's my wife who gets me to go to the doctors. I mean, it's that simple. You know, okay. No, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I have a question. Oh, yes, sir. I'm from West Africa. Yep. And really, I don't think I'm going to sleep well tonight. <laughs> Sorry. What? But, no, thank you. Is there, I mean, is there, I mean, why West Africa, I mean, there must be this. It's genetics. Pattern? It's genetics. It's why people have, you know, blue eyes or brown hair or, or you know, six toes. It's, it's, it's what, unfortunately, it's what happens uh, before we're born. 
Yes. Is there a different approach in Europe than it is in America, or they're all the same? No, Europe uh, would tend to uh, be just as aggressive in doing PSAs and ultrasounds as, as we are here. However, they probably would, would uh, not do as much surgery uh, on, their, uh, on prostate cancer as we do. Um, I mean, different areas, for example, the Caribbean, their incidence of their mortality from prostate cancer is, is much higher than ours. Why is that? One, they have a lot of African Americans or Af Africans, and number two, they don't they don't get screened, whether it's because of uh, economics or culture. We don't know, but they oftentimes will, will have uh, far advanced disease when they're diagnosed. So it really varies. Y yes, sir. Go ahead. You raised your hand. Yes. Uh I just wanted to mention um, my sister uh, came, my sister lives in Virginia, came up a couple of years ago and we did a, she wanted to do Trace the Family Tree and all of that. And uh, so we did all of that and we're from West Africa. And I also had prostate cancer. Right. And my brother was actually my savior because he had it first. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that, uh, you know, after that, when my, we both had the same uh, doctor, mm -hmm. practitioner doctor, and uh, when my PSA went up, uh, I didn't hesitate to, you know, to go forward and, and, and go through all of the tests and what have you, and come to find out that I did have it, and I had my prostate removed. But my brother was my hero because he, he's the one. Sure that I knew, you know, family, you know, in the family, and I knew that there was no mistake made. So um, I, I just wanted to pass that on. That my family is from West Africa, and uh, unfortunately, you know, yeah, you make an important point. I mean, over the years, we found that if we had a patient uh, who had pro diagnosed prostate cancer and they had a brother, uh, the chances are that the brother was going to get it at least 50% of the time. Absolutely. Yeah. What about a grandfather? Oh, yeah. Um, probably, the, probably the same. Maybe not the same ratio, but would be at an increased risk. Yeah. yeah. So if, you, if, if your grandfather had it and you have sons, yes, they should be checked. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, there's been a lot of speculation, but they think that people who have a low-fat diet tend to have a less incidence of prostate cancer. They've, they've speculated that maybe that's why the Japanese have a lower incidence of prostate cancer, because they eat a lot of fish and not much red meat. Oh, yes, sir? Well, they're, um, they're researching presently um, some genetic test to be able to uh, predict the, the likelihood of prostate cancer, uh, especially in patients who have uh, had elevated PSAs but negative biopsies. Uh, you've heard of the, the BRCA gene in, in breast cancer, but I think there's a BRCA2 that they're testing for, for prostate cancer. There's also um, a free PSA or prosthetic uh, uh, prosthetic uh, specific antigen velocity. Uh, so there are a number of things that they're, that they're testing presently, but nothing that's out for the general public at the present. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was very informative. Thank you very much, Doctor. We're now going to hear from Dr. Zaltz. So, now, I'm what was your name, ma'am? I'm forgetting. My name? Yeah. My name is Dee Dee Calhoun. So, Dee Dee, when you said something, I'm going to have Ms. Ellis read what my wife texted me today. Okay. Did you call to rebook your physical next week? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely right. Um, I want to stand over here. I think my voice booms enough. I need a microphone, for better or worse. Um, so 
I'll just try to, you know, these are some things that I picked out as far as if they wanted me to talk about a few things that we do here. And some, I, maybe some nerdy doctor uh, who treats cancer all day long talk, but at least I'll try to come up with some things and I'll show you some pictures which I always think are kind of useful. Um, but basically looking at some important breakthrough in a clinical trial that was published, um, radiation oncology innovation that we have here at Good Samaritan as well as Stewart, um, and some new diagnostic testing for prostate cancer recurrence, because prostate cancer can come back. Um, so, so basically one of the big things for, surprisingly for many years, we never had a clinical, randomized clinical trial um, for prostate cancer, men with prostate cancer comparing surgery and radiation. So it's absolutely astounding, I'm sure Dr. Carl can agree that for a cancer that has a second highest incidence in men, that we can never compare two different modalities of treatment. Um, and that's been going on for 40 years. Um, so we couldn't do it, so the Europeans could. Um, so the Europeans finally completed a randomized trial that came out in 2017. Um, it was published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, which I'm going to show you in a minute. So this is called the PROTECT trial. Um, this study was a 10-year uh, study um, comparing, looking at men with generally, most men were either what we call lower intermediate risk disease, or men with high risk disease, which is a little bit of a different category, but most of these people were in low and intermediate risk disease. These are the patients, you know, <coughs> Generally, men with high risk, we certainly want to treat them. Men with low and intermediate risk, there are a lot of treatment options available to them. Um, so this data, I mean, oncologists have been waiting for this for a lifetime. Um, there's been always talks between neurology and radiation about what's the best method of treatment. Um, and finally, we could prove this in the pudding. So basically, this trial, they basically had 1,600 men with either lower intermediate risk prostate cancer. And about half or a third of them, sorry, were assigned to what we call active surveillance which is what uh, Victor has, is doing right now. So basically saying you can do active surveillance, which is basically watching your prostate cancer, having your PSA, that blood test, done every six months, maybe rebiopsying the prostate. There's also another group that underwent a prostatectomy, and finally patients who got radiation therapy. So they basically had these men were randomly assigned to one of these three groups. So one of the things we call, is a fancy doctor term, we say equipoise. Um, so one of the reasons why they felt we couldn't do randomized trials in the United States was because of equipoise, because some people felt that if they felt that surgery was better, then they shouldn't put a patient on a clinical trial. Or if you felt that radiation was better, you shouldn't put that patient on a clinical trial comparing it to something else. So there's always this issue we call equipoise in the United States regarding um, whether we, how we put patients on trial. And Europe was able to kind of beat the equipoise. So audience participation, because you're here now and you're, you're being active. So for people who underwent, what percent of patients for low and these lower lower risk or intermediate risk disease patients died from prostate cancer at 10 years? Now if I get a show of hands or somebody speak up, or you can think in your mind and hold your answer to yourself because maybe you don't want to you know, make a mistake, but at, at surgery, how many people do you think were alive or how many percent of patients died after 10 years from prostate cancer? Anybody? 5%. 5%. And higher? Ah, uh, 15 percent, five, 15 percent. So these are basically, if you had to take a number, just just look at this yourself. You can keep it to yourself. Do you believe that there's a 10 percent patients died after surgery who had prostate cancer, died from prostate cancer? Was it 1 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent? What about the people who just said, let me just watch. Let's just not do anything. And the same thing with radiation therapy. So just think about it. Again, people have generally what we call low risk disease or intermediate risk disease. You can think about what percent of men do you think after 10 years died from their prostate cancer? Which one do you think did better? Surgery or radiation? Surgery. Surgery. All right. So, after 10 years, this slide right here, you can see right up top. Surgery is the red line, radiation is the blue, active surveillance is the green line. You guys are all smart enough to see that those lines are all what? Overlapping, aren't they? Yes, they are. At 10 years. Here we go. Prostate cancer specific mortality. The chance of a man dying of prostate cancer after 10 years is about what? 1% for low and intermediate risk disease. Whether or not you did surgery, whether or not you did radiation, or what Victor is doing, active surveillance. Okay? So right here, this is our, this is level one evidence showing that for men with low and intermediate prostate cancer, it really doesn't matter what you do for the first 10 years. 
you can do surgery, you can do radiation, you can do active surveillance. That's why we talk to the doctor, we want to see basically how healthy you are. And I always tell every man who comes in, just don't worry about your prostate cancer. Dr. McCarroll says, you really don't have any symptoms. Don't worry about your prostate cancer. Number one killer of men in your age group is what? Heart, Heart disease. Heart, by far. So when I see somebody come in, I got a little weight, extra weight, I mean, no doubt about it. He's got a little extra weight around the belly. I'm like, lose the weight, you're going to live longer than what this prostate cancer. For, for low and intermediate risk disease. High risk disease is something else. But for low and intermediate risk disease, it's the most important thing. Get out and exercise, eat healthy, bottom line. And enough said. But so 10 years. So, but there is, there is something to be made from this. So we're not saying don't do anything about your prostate cancer. Because, okay, at 10 years, we're doing great. We're 99% chance not going to die of our prostate cancer at 10 years for men with low intermediate risk disease. However, the concern is this, is that what you do see, what's, what this is basically a freedom from disease progression. This is all a bunch of statistical analyses. But again, you see the blue and the red lines, which are surgery and radiation, are what? Overlapping, right? You see the green line. These are the men who are on active surveillance. So over the period of about 10 years, what happens is the men who chose active surveillance are starting to progress. Now, not a lot, though. Let's be, let's be fair, not a lot, but some of these men are progressing. So incidence of clinical progression for people with active surveillance after 10 years, about 20%, were those patients who either got radiation or surgery, 9%. Radiation and surgery equivalent at 10 years in terms of freedom from clinical pro pro progression. 10 year incidence of metastatic disease, so out of 500 men who had, met, who had prostate cancer, out of the 500 men who, who were on active surveillance, 33 men died of prostate cancer, or had metastatic disease, I'm sorry. For surgery, 13 men, radiation, 16. These two were surgery and radiation considered to be statistically the same, where, but it's a little bit better than the active surveillance group. So what happened on this trial, what they saw was about half the men at some point, the reason why we check your PSA, maybe do a repeat biopsy is to see if it progresses. Then what would happen, you'd end up in this group here, in a clinical progression. Half the men on the active surveillance ended up getting some form of radiation or surgery during this clinical trial. So, but well, the other thing, this, this is kind of also shows a nice natural history of prostate cancer and the fact that prostate cancer is not going to get you. I always tell my patients today, tomorrow, next year, two years, four years down the road. But if you sit there and you're about 60, 65, you're getting ready for retirement, you want your kind of feet in the sand on the beach, and you picture yourself out 15 years from now enjoying yourself. That's when you may want to start considering treatment for your prostate cancer for low and intermediate risk disease. So that's kind of like that. So for low and intermediate risk, now high risk disease is something different. So one of the things that we're doing here is um, for radiation therapy. Um, I work with Dr. McCardle's group. Um, he's been uh, worked with him in the past as well. A lot of patients. I still work with a lot of the a lot of the, uh, the urologists. We have a great uh, atmosphere um, working with uh, with uh, doctors. Uh, Fitzgerald and Frankel, the Pushney, and the Dr. Mc, um, Dr. McCahill, and Dr. Brightboard now, who's over there, um, talk a lot about patients. Um, a lot of times, when patients diagnosed with prostate cancer, they come to see me for not a second opinion, but a opinion about radiation and surgery. Because I don't try to sell you anything. I just try to say you can do anything you want, basically, for it. Because I know I can't sit there and say radiation is better, and I can't say surgery is better. It's your option. But that's the <clears> options, and that's the importance of hearing it from different perspectives, so you hear the options and you hear the side effects, because generally I tell them to choose on side effects, because the outcomes are the same. So, one of the things, the radiation therapies are well established, we've been doing radiation therapy for prostate cancer for about 60, 70 years, probably long before I was born. Um, one of the biggest things about radiation is, it's not the biggest thing, but it's one of the uncommon, but a late toxicities, rectal irritation caused by radiation, I'll, I'll show you why in a minute, and we've been trying to improve those outcomes. So, this is basically a radiation plan. <coughs> So this is like a man standing right here, and I chop right in half. This green line, that's actually, yes, the green line, yeah. So this green line here basically outlines the prostate. This right here is the pubic bone. So if you feel the bone kind of right here, that's your pubic bone. Your prostate sits right behind it. This brown area, this brown line you see here, that's actually the rectum. That's why you can put a finger in the rectum and feel the prostate. Obviously this is a little bit magnified. Uh, so, but. What you can see here is that where the green line is, and that's what I want to treat for the disease, and what I did here was the radiation, this, this red area, is the dose of radiation I want to give to the prostate. One of the issues here is you can see that 
the brown part, which is the rectum, the radiation is getting full dose to the rectum. We just can't avoid it because of the fact that it sits right next to it. So one of the things you can kind of see here, so this is kind of if you took a, a slice of your body this way, this is an MRI. This shows the prostate right here, and you can see the rectum sitting right behind it. So what they did is they basically, they came up with this hydrogel spacer that we use now, and basically you can see here, this is a hydrogel spacer where they actually inject this um, hydrogel, it's a bio, it's a bioabsorbable gel, and it, space, it puts a space between the prostate and the rectum. You can see there's no space here, it's right next to it. Here, it's, uh, it's basically creating a space. Within 90 days, the body reabsorbs the gel. So this is actually the gel, or this is actually the same patient 12 months out, and you can see there's no more space there, so the gel has been absorbed by the body naturally. So this is kind of, again, a cut. You can see here's the bladder. Right there's the prostate. There's the rectum. This is the hydrogel. So you can see here it's a space now that I have between the prostate and the rectum. That wasn't there before, because before usually the rectum is hitting right next to the prostate. So again, you can remember the green line is the prostate, the rectum sits here. My red line here is treating the rectum to a high dose of radiation. This is why we see some toxicity sometimes from radiation therapy, sometimes during, and certainly sometimes after the treatment. That's what we want to avoid. So now, here's a plan. So we started doing this. The, the um, Medicare approved this in January 2018. I've worked with Dr. Fitzgerald, uh, the Dr. Um, McCardle's office, and we, as soon as we saw this come out, we implemented it. Um, so basically, now again, here's the prostate in pink here. Here's the hydrogel that, we, that Dr. Um, Fitzgerald placed right here. And now you can see that dose of radiation, none of it touches the rectum at all. So it's a fantastic way. The patients, we've been doing this uh, for treatment. I definitely noted um, that patients had less um, rectal irritation during treatment and certainly, and certainly afterwards. So that's one of the things that we're doing here. Um, we're still trying to com continue to do this. The, um, this was also done on a randomized trial. And they showed that this spacer gels reduced the risk of rectal toxicity. Um, there was a little bit of a blip. Medicare did pay for it until recently. The only Massachusetts Medicare decided not to pay for it, but they're, um, they're actively fighting it to get back for a payment um, as far as being covered by insurance. So this is kind of my last thing I'm going to kind of talk about, something that's kind of nice that's been going on with uh, prostate cancer. Um, so basically, I had a 70 year old gentleman, um, guy's in way better health than I'll ever be. Um, he had a high risk prostate cancer and in 2013. He ended up getting a, a robotic prostatectomy. Um, after the prostatectomy, um, as you know, Dr. Dr. Ricardo alluded to, the prostate produces PSA. It's the only thing in the body that produces PSA. So if you have any PSA in your body after a prostatectomy, you're in trouble. That means the cancer is back. So PSA recurred in 2015. So what we did was a normal workup. We did a CAT scan, the abdomen, the pelvis, and a bone scan, looking to see if we could find the disease. It is very rare that we ever find disease with low PSAs, but we do it anyways just to dot our I's and cross our T's. If we see that the person doesn't have any evidence of metastatic disease or we can't find it, then generally we offer radiation therapy to where the prostate was to kind of clear it up. And about 70% of the time that we do that, the PSA goes down, meaning that we've hit the target. But sometimes, unfortunately for this gentleman, the PSA continued to rise. So it went up to 2.3, which isn't high, but remember, he doesn't have a prostate. It should be zero. So this is actually quite high. Um, so it was too low. Again, we said we could do a bone scan. So now I got a gentleman who's had surgery. PSA came back, meaning the cancer's back. We then did radiation therapy. P PSA continued to rise. Well, now what the general treatment would have been, after bone scan and CAT scan negative, would be to watch him and say, we can't do any more. We're done. We're going to watch you. Maybe we'll put you on hormones. No men or androgen deprivation. It's really not hormones. Androgen deprivation therapy. That can be hard for men for long term. Um, he's a very active person. Um, and he did not want to do that as well. But sometimes we watch it. But there's a new um, imaging study that we looked at. And it's basically called an Aximan scan. It's basically a PET CT scan. It's a PET CT scan for prostate cancer. PET CT scans in general, whether you've heard PET CT scans for other cancers, PET CT scans are not approved for prostate cancer, just because they don't pick up prostate cancer. However, there's a new scan called an Aximan scan, which is a form of PET scan. However, it's specific for prostate um, cancer. It's specific for men who've had recurrences after they've undergone radiation therapy or after they've undergone surgery. So we said, all right, why don't we get an Aximan scan? So we sent him in town. We don't have it here right now, but we're going to be working on bringing that here. 
So this is him. He's kind of laying down, arms up, assuming the position. This is normal. This is his liver. This is, this is part of the bowel. This is all normal. What you see here is a little dot. What we found is a little lymph node. A little lymph node that was there that was not seen on the CAT scans before. And I actually went back to his original CAT scan prior to his surgery, and he had lymph nodes removed at the time of surgery, and they were all negative. I think he had 13 lymph nodes removed, and they were all negative. I went back and looked at his CAT scan from 2013 when he originally was diagnosed with prostate cancer. There was a little dot there, smallest little dot. Wasn't picked up at the time of surgery, but not because the surgeon did the wrong thing. It's just a small little lymph node. He did 13 others. They were all negative. So here we are with a guy now who no one would have ever known that he had this lymph node positive. Now, what do I do with this? Because now this is all new information. We're getting this. This is all real-time information. This is where your, the randomized trial I showed you earlier where we can sit there and say, OK, this is how we do it. <coughs> now we're talking about, now we're cutting edge. Now we're, now we're looking at a new modality and saying, what do we do with this now? Now I can sit there. I see this lymph node that's involved. But what do I do with it? How do I treat it? Because no there's not a lot of data. So this is where the art of medicine comes into play. This is where the doctor, I'm sure Dr. McCarl knows, this is where the fun part is yeah. using your mind, using years of experience and trying to come up with things and things that sometimes sound out of, sound out of the box. But you're trying to do what's best for the patient. I got a guy who's 73 now, he's healthy as hell. You know, he does not want to go on hormones. So I said, you know, what we could try to do is re-irradiate your pelvis and treat the lymph nodes and hit that lymph node to a higher dose of radiation. Sounds crazy, I've never done it before. I said, why don't you go in town for a second opinion and talk to a doctor in town, see what he thinks. So we sent him in town. I said, you know what? <coughs> I would try that. It's an option. Otherwise, you can do hormones. Hormones would not cure him. Maybe this would. So we re-irradiated this pelvis. Within one month after, his PSA went from 2.38 to undetectable. Wow. So this is something that um, it's new and it's exciting. It gives us opportunities for to find men who either ha after surgery have a recurrence for prostate cancer or after radiation therapy have a recurrence after prostate cancer. We may be able to find prostate cancer that we could never find before. And I can guarantee you, I'm sure Dr. McCarlo will agree, this guy a year ago would have been written off yeah. as incurable and just waited out, buddy. So this is what we're doing now. This is what we have access to. Um, it's really exciting for us. It allows us to be doctors and to kind of use our minds on how best to treat patients. Um, I think that's it for my talk. Any uh, questions? Besides the uh, lymph nodes, um, are there other organs that uh, threaten the prostate with the cancer if they're impacted? Like so, the bladder? So prostate cancer generally, when it goes anywhere, it's going to go to the bones. You know, 95% of the time when it spreads, it's not curable, it goes to the bones. So I always call, you know, prostate cancer to me is, is I always tell every one of my patients, and they'll swear by it, I say this every time, it's the worst layaway plan ever for treatment. Because we're really not doing anything for you now. As you can see, like year zero through five for these low and intermediate risk patients, they're perfectly fine. What we are all going to give them, whether it be surgery or radiation, we're going to give them side effects. What we're really trying to do is stop the cancer from spreading to the bones. When it goes to the bones, you're not curable anymore. When it goes to the bones, you got pain, caused a lot of bone pain, um, suffering, fractures, bad, bad things. So that's what we're really trying to stop for. So you know, it's it's a bad layaway plan because you know, usually you go to Best Buy, you buy a new TV, 60 inch TV, you put it on, and they say, you know what, pay us five years later. So you get to enjoy that brand new TV for five years, and then the bill comes later, and you're like, okay. With prostate cancer, it's the opposite. You're getting all your side effects up front. The costs are up front. You're not getting the benefit to about 10 years from now, five years from now, you know, and, and, and beyond. Because um, most persons that I talk to often assume that they have prostate cancer, right away they're going to have bladder cancer, right along with it. So that's the great information. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> you said that the, uh, uh, the, the body absorbs the gel that, that separates the, the organs. Uh, how long does it take for the body to absorb the gel, and do you go back in and put more gel in? Or? 90 days. Generally lasts 90 days. Nin 90 days. Mm -hmm. the, the, so over time, over the 90-day period, so it usually lasts through the course of radiation, and the body absorbs it. It's a biodegradable, uh, body absorbable, with uh, basically things that are in the body with hyaluronic acid and things like is that. It, is it a, a, a highly invasive procedure? Or? So the way they place it, they place it through the perineum, which is basically between your scrotum and your anus, and they place a needle in there. 
um, and then they inject the material in, in the what's called the perineum. I put it this way: I would say it is invasive. I would not want to have it done. However, as far as you know, no one, no one wants anything. I always say it's better than the alternative. I always say everything. You know, patients when they do exams, sorry, Dr. McCarroll for years, like, oh, I got to do the prostate exam. I tell them, I don't want to do it either. You know, it's not like I come here to work on it and do this either. But it's part of what we have to do. Yes. Is proton beam therapy better than normal radiation oncology? Ah, there we go. Proton, proton beam, you're asking. So, so proton beam therapy. Proton beam therapy is a way to deliver radiation. The proton beam does the same exact damage that photons, which is what 99% of radiation centers use to treat any kind of cancer. It does, it, it attacks cancer the same way. Proton beam therapy has a theoretical benefit in that while radiation therapy, if I treat, if I put a radiation beam through here, it's basically coming out the other side to some degree. It's gonna lose some of the dose, but a lot of the dose gets absorbed where I wanna treat it but it'll generally come out the other side. With proton beam, you can actually stop the beam within a, within, within a millimeter. So it's, it's, it's amazing at how precise you can stop it. Having said that, with proton beam, there's, that preciseness can also get you in trouble because the prostate moves. The bladder sits on top of my fist is the prostate, the bladder sits on top of the prostate, yeah. my rectum sits behind the prostate. If my bladder's filled with urine, it can push the prostate down. If my rectum's got gas or stool that day, it can push the prostate forward. So that precision for protons, while it is amazing, the precision, you gotta be careful because it can get you into trouble where you're over precise and you're missing your target. They've done studies looking at proton beam and outcomes. Um, there's been no survival data benefit regarding protons versus photons. There may be possibly a reduced risk of toxicity, but that really hasn't been shown too much. And a lot of insurance companies won't pay for it because it's about four times the cost. So there, there, the other option, so there's external beam radiation, which is what I largely do here and most clinics do. There's also something I've done in the past called brachytherapy, and brachytherapy in German just means breaking and stop, so or, or close. Um, so brachytherapy means close therapy. So what that is, we're taking uh, radioactive seeds, anywhere between 80 and 100 um, radioactive seeds about the size of a grain of rice, and you implant them into the prostate uh, through the perineum using needles. Um, under a, generally an a outpatient OR scenario. Um, so you place these seeds, and they, there's, there's all different types of seeds that you can place. Um, they're radioactive. Um, they do stay in the body. They are permanent. Um, they, you will go home radioactive. Unlike radiation, when you come to my clinic, you, you're not radioactive when you go home, so you can be around little kids. When you have seed implants, though, you will go home radioactive for some degree. you got to kind of stay away from the wife and the kids for a little bit. Um, but it's a very good way to do um, prostate radiation therapy. Um, some patients who have a little bit higher um, urinary um, symptoms up front are generally not good candidates for it because the seed implants can cause uh, an outlet obstruction a little bit more aggressively than other types of forms of radiation. Any side effects? Other side effects for everything. Um, yeah, so for which one? Radiation? Radiation. So the number one, you know, the way we do it, um, I would generally say, so the radiation here we do for eight weeks, we're trying to get down to a shorter course of treatment especially if we can use the uh, spacer gel. Um, but I'd say the first four weeks, patients usually don't have much side effects at all. About week four, they start having increased frequency and urgency to urinate. Um, very low risk of incontinence with radiation, and sometimes you have some change in your bowel habits. There's no burns on your body. Um, no one knows you're getting treatment. I have many men who go to work every day. I've had men who are triathlete, triathletes who train throughout that. Um, little fatigue. After the treatment's done, about one to two weeks later, usually the urinary symptoms are gone. Um, the bowel symptoms usually resolve. Um, there is a, one of the bigger concerns, um, is probably about 10 to 20 percent of men will get a little bit of rectal bleeding within the first year after treatment, and that's usually some blood in the toilet paper, usually nothing pouring out of you, but some blood in the toilet paper. But some men do have to get a little bit of the area of the rectum cauterized uh, if it is still bleeding. That's one of the reasons why we like the space over, is because it kind of protects that rectum and it'll hopefully reduce that risk of any kind of late side effects. So. Thank you. was very educational. We have one last presenter, Dr. Stern. Hello. 
Uh, everyone, thank you so much for being here today. Um, it is, uh, it is, you are giving us an opportunity to make a difference. You are giving us an opportunity to make sure we will not be losing people like, um, thank you. We will not be uh, losing people like, like Mr. Mero. Or um, uh, in June 2016, we had uh, here a prostate cancer survivor in late stages and terminal stages of his disease, he had the courage to come and to appeal to everyone in Brockton to please make sure, uh, get tested so that people will not be, will end up in his, in his position. Unfortunately, we lost uh, uh, Robert Hayden since that time. We do not want to lose people to prostate cancer because mm -hmm. prostate cancer is curable 99% when it is detected early. Uh, Dr. Zolz just uh, painted a very exciting picture of the cutting edge clinical advances, latest clinical advances in uh, treatment of prostate cancer. But there is also a very exciting research going on that made it possible for, on, for example, Didi asked about menogram, right? Something that is similar to men um, that we have for women in mammograms, right? Uh, Victor is, uh, by definition, is, uh, um, of course, he is uh, a black man. He's at high risk of prostate cancer. His physician would not have dared not to administer immediate treatment, either urology, uh, either surgery or um, radiation treatment, if he did not have a very precise diagnostic tool, which he mentioned, magnetic resonance imaging. Magnetic resonance imaging showed exact location um, of uh, abnormalities. It guided biopsy into exactly the most suspicious area. And based on that, physicians could be sure that, uh, could be sure that uh, Victor did not have aggressive enough tumor. He had the kind of low risk or intermediate risk um, uh, prostate cancer that did not require any intervention. And using this and similar precision diagnostic tools, um, when did you, when were, were you diagnosed for the first time? At around 2013. 2012, 2013. 2013. So for the last five years, uh, being carefully monitored with imaging and other precision diagnostic tools, um, Victor actually did not ever need, need, need to have um, treatment and instead, he recently got married. <laughs> which we haven't uh, talked about yet. Yeah, which he did not say anything about. We haven't talked but about this kind side of, effects, yeah. you know, impotence and incontinence, but those are side effects that you of have treatment, to deal with. Of current treatment. Right. So right now we have incredibly exciting research that actually uh, it, molecular tests. Somebody mentioned genetic testing. We have, um, uh, n new versions of PSA. PSA still is going to stay for, uh, for us, with us, for a long time as screening tool. But screening tool is, a, is uh, administered in healthy men without any symptoms, only to determine which man is at risk of little prostate cancer. They're using MRI to, to just like we did with uh, Victor, in order to point biopsy in the right direction. Uh, the leading um, professional organization uh, in cancer in this country is called National Comprehensive Cancer Network, consisting of top experts in research and clinical care. And they issued guideline as of 2017 that menogram, MRI, for example, should be administered to men before biopsy, and biopsy should not be done without guidance by imaging. That's what we do in any other organ. A prostate is the last organ in a human body when we are doing blind biopsies. 
when you when we are doing biopsy once again somebody talked about genetic um, tissue analysis when we do biopsy and send biopsy for the kind of standard evaluation under microscope that Dr. McArdle was talking about, when we are grading aggressiveness of prostate cancer from mm -hmm. 2 to 10, right now we have additional mm -hmm. genetic uh, testing of prostate cancer. And this genetic, what we call genetic cancer profiling, can help us determine this great biological precision, which is complementary to usual scoring. It can predict with great uh, biologic precision which man prostate cancer is lower risk, is not likely to progress, and which man's prostate cancer is likely to progress and become lethal. And this kind of cancer genetic analysis can help us not only to determine that, but also help guide, can, can, uh, can help the selection of appropriate treatment that would be right for this particular individual man. So we have essentially over the last three, five uh, years, we, we saw such a proliferation, we've seen such a proliferation of precision diagnostic tools so, so that right now with great hope, we are looking into the future of integrating these precision tools, this precision treatment. But my talk today, and a lot of clinical trials, cutting edge clinical trials, published over the last couple of years that Dr. Zolz mentioned, unfortunately, did not use this very precise diagnostic tools that will recalibrate and transform the way we understand, the way we monitor, the way we treat prostate cancer. Uh, what I would like to discuss today, however, is um, what men, um, if I can figure out how to advance my slides, Okay. What I would like to address first, why we are here in Brockton. Prostate cancer mortality in Brockton and Plymouth County, uh, Plymouth County is not acceptable. If we look at the, even at, uh, at the most recent, but unfortunately, um, this data ended at 2009, but in Massachusetts, this is the, recent, the most recent data we have. We will see that for all, if we, talk, if we take all men, prostate cancer mortality in Brockton is 30% higher compared to state average. If we look at Caucasian population, we will see that prostate cancer mortality in Caucasian men is about 15% higher in Brockton compared to Caucasian men um, uh, mortality elsewhere uh, average for Massachusetts. When we look at black men, we see that prostate cancer mortality is 39% higher than state average for black men. It, uh, Brockton has some of the highest, if not the highest mortality among black men in Massachusetts. So if you look at prostate vis-a-vis -vis breast cancer in Brockton, we will see that in white population, prostate cancer, uh, prostate cancer mortality is the same as breast cancer, just about. If we look in black, uh, population, prostate cancer mortality is more than three times higher than breast cancer. Wow. And why is it happening? Exactly uh, starting with Gigi's comment that 70% of women drive healthcare decisions, and, uh, healthcare decisions in families. Women rose against breast cancer we had armed women with powerful um, uh, tools for early diagnosis of breast cancer. I'm sorry? Okay. Thank you so much, Janet. And right now, 
in Massachusetts, we have no difference in breast cancer mortality between white and black women. Early detection is a great equalizer. We are far behind breast cancer in prostate cancer. If you look nationally, some of you already mentioned, and you could see from our um, banner, that if, if we look at uh, national average, black men, including Hispanic men, are two and a half times more likely to die for, uh, of prostate cancer. If we look at Brockton, we will see that black men, roughly 3.7 times, are more likely to die of prostate cancer than Caucasian men. And yet, early with early detection, every man is alive at five years. 100% of men are alive. With late diagnosis, when prostate cancer spreads uh, outside of the pr prostate, particularly into the bones, only 28% of men are alive with advanced prostate cancer. It means that in five years, with late diagnosis of prostate cancer, we lost 72 out of 100 men with advanced prostate cancer. This is unacceptable. So what, what is the best way uh, to diagnose prostate cancer early? Today, it is simple blood test that was mentioned several times already. We call it PSA test. And yet men need to know risk and benefits of that test. Risk of, uh, risk of this test, potentially uh, unnecessary biopsy that can cause pain and infection. But it is important to say that no more than about 10% of men who get screened ended up, end up with biopsy. In addition, uh, men who have biopsy, about 75% of them roughly, will not have cancer at all. They will have inflammation. They will have benign enlargement of the prostate, which is very common, particularly after the age of uh, 50. An additional 12% of men will have the kind of low-risk prostate cancer that Dr. Zolz was talking about that is not likely to cause harm no matter what you do to that cancer. Um, unnecessary biopsy also can lead to unnecessary treatment. On a positive side, less than 1% of all men undergoing screening get, um, are at risk of having unnecessary treatment with all the complications that um, uh, were mentioned by uh, Victor. And of course, the greatest benefit is that PSA testing is the best option we have today and the best option we'll have for many years to come for early detection of prostate cancer. Now, in order for men to have the kind of benefit from screening that women have gotten from mammography screening, what men need to know before PSA testing and what men need to know after PSA testing? Let's start with what men need to know before testing. Men must know their risk. Who is at risk of prostate cancer? Some, somebody already, actually it was mentioned several times, African heritage, black including Hispanic men. Family history of prostate cancer, particularly if your father or brother was affected by prostate cancer. Increasing age, 50 and above. These are high these are high risk for prostate cancer. Men who have this history are at high risk of prostate cancer. How can we how can you ensure early detection? Please ask your doctor for PSA blood test. During your physical examination, ask your doctor for digital rectal exam. Nobody likes digital rectal exam. Physicians don't like it. Patients do not like it. But it happens to be important. The challenge is that by that time, uh, and, and Dr. McArdle made it very clear that 
it is an important part of uh, physical examination. It is important to know if prostate feels normal or not on physical examination. By the same token, by the time physicians can feel abnormality in the prostate, it may be too late. Blood tests can detect uh, uh, prostate cancer much more earlier before it can be found on physical examination. When you need to talk to your doctor, according to the best evidence you have today, if you are at high risk of prostate cancer, you need to start conversation with your doctor at the age of 40. If you are at average risk of prostate cancer, you need to start this conversation um, with your doctor at the age of 45. What do you need to know before testing? No sex and exercise for at least a week. Exercise test raises <coughs> PSA levels and it can get very scary. We had situations when uh, men PSA came back uh, over four and then they went back, they repeated their PSA testing no sex, no exercise for one week, and it felt uh, uh, to under less than one where probability of life-threatening prostate cancer is extremely low. If you're in poor health and you're age 75 and older, the value of PSA testing for you is going to be very limited because PSA screening is predictive test. It tells physicians whether or not you, likely, you are likely to develop prostate cancer, particularly little prostate cancer, within 5, 10, 20, 30 years. So if somebody is very ill and um, life expectancy is less than 10 years, the value of prostate cancer screening is not going to be adequate. What do you need to know after? prostate cancer screening. Before, as it was mentioned by Dr. McArdle, we thought in medicine that if PSA level is four and above, this is abnormal. Recent scientific data uh, showed something different. What recent data showed that if PSA, there are almost like three shades of, of gray, if you will, within uh, PSA of four. If your PSA level is less than one, which is dominating majority of men, at least 75%, particularly younger men, your risk is low. If you are younger than 60, you, you need to talk to your doctor if your PSA is la less than one. About having uh, tests maybe two to four years, not that frequently. If you are 60 years old and your PSA is less than one, you, you may ask your doctor if you need to be tested altogether, most likely you will not need PSA testing anymore. If you are 60, if your PSA is less than one, probability of little prostate cancer is extremely low. And uh, you do not want to learn about harmless prostate cancer and then worry about it. If PSA, however, is more than one, or one and above, and climbing to three, you are at higher risk of prostate cancer. Your risk is higher. Ask your doctor about testing more frequently, at least every one to two years, preferably for African-American men, it, it will be every one year. And you need to watch very carefully carefully the level of your PSA. If your PSA will start climbing to three and above, you need to discuss you, uh, with your doctor about referral to a prostate cancer expert, radiation oncologist, or urologist in order to actually figure out what is, what is going on because prostate cancer expert will be in a position to decide if more precise and reliable diagnostic testing is, uh, which, which has been validated recently, uh, may be indicated to figure out whether or not you have cancer or not, or whether or not, if it is cancer, whether or not it, it may be little prostate cancer or something that you do not need to worry about. Uh, 
with um, you also can discuss with uh, 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 with expert possibility of getting MRI. The, the most recent data indicate that between MRI and more advanced blood tests or urine tests, we can eliminate unnecessary biopsies in a significant number of men in about, uh, in about uh, uh, roughly 40-50% um, of men. In best institutions at Harvard Medical School, we can eliminate the necessary biopsy up to 80%. And then, if this test, more precise test indicate probability of little prostate cancer, only then expert will discuss with you uh, whether or not you need biopsy. So that's exactly what you need to know in order to take charge of your prostate health. Do you have any questions? Yes, please. I'm just curious. They give you a finasteride to reduce the size of the prostate, which you're thinking on it, and is it dangerous or not? At one time, you said it was dangerous. I did not hear the f uh, what I, I did not hear your full question, unfortunately. Uh, what I heard is, part of what I heard is that whether or not finasteride, a, a medication can be given to reduce probability of prostate cancer, to prevent prostate cancer, correct? Or, or to? Reduce the size. Or reduce the size to the prostate, absolutely. It can prevent cancer. It can reduce the size of the prostate based on the evidence we have. Unfortunately, finasteride also was associated with greater probability of more aggressive prostate cancer. And this actually um, created situation when physicians no longer are comfortable administering uh, finasteride. Uh, Jason, do you want to comment? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, they did show basically reduce the risk of prostate cancer, but you end up with having higher grade disease and not quite sure why that happened. The other thing with finasteride, which a lot of people don't know, um, unless you're kind of into uh, treating prostate cancer, is um, finasteride drops your PSA level. So your PSA level can actually be misleading. Um, so if you're on finasteride and, you know, let's say your PSA was six, on finasteride it may only be three. So that's one of the reasons why it's possible you may get more high grade diseases. But I see a lot of men with on finasteride, if they have a PSA of eight, I'm basically assuming it's 16, and a lot of times it correlates with higher grade disease. So if you're on finasteride, you just gotta, it's, okay, it's an okay drug to be on. It's been shown to reduce some things. It does work effectively for what it does as far as uh, BPH and the such. Um, so it is a good drug. You just need to be mindful of you know, why you're on it and, and you know, get your PSA screen and realize that your PSA may be artificially lowered um, by the finasteride. Yeah, and when you're on finasteride, you need to particularly be careful about discussing with your physician level of PSA because it is artificially lower and uh, you need to be very careful about uh, making sure that prostate cancer, particularly more aggressive, higher grade prostate cancer will not be missed. Yes, please. I just wanted to talk about uh, the diet, for example. Uh, the choice of eating red meat versus uh, chicken versus uh, uh, fish. fish. What do you all recommend? Um, if you do not have really strong data about any of it, to be honest, uh, but I do always, as it was already pointed out by Dr. McArdle, um, but uh, uh, I do, but there is a commonsensical approach. And I would uh, never forget the slide that was shown by one of the top cancer experts in the world, Bill Nelson, who happens to be a head of cancer center for Johns Hopkins. And he had this very interesting slide in one of his presentation. It was fried meat. And the title of the slide was The Enemy. <laughs> It's just a commonsensical approach. We do not really have strong data um, on um, what kind of diet would be better, what kind of diet will not be better. We suspect that whatever diet men have in Japan helps them not have, which is predominantly fish rather than meat, helps them to have very low probability of prostate cancer. Um, and we sort of suspect strongly that fried meat is the 
enemy, but we do not have strong data to support that. Jason, do you have? Uh, I mean, I, I think that, you know, eat your, eat your fruits and vegetables, like your mom said, you know, um, meat is, you know, we know red meat, is, besides prostate cancer, you gotta look at your overall diet. I mean, if you focus on prostate cancer, you're missing the boat on overall heart health, which again, as I said, is the number one killer of any man and woman. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know that uh, red meats are have an increased risk of colorectal cancers besides mm -hmm. prostate, colorectal cancer being the most common cancer. So higher risk of colorectal cancer. We know red meats, as far as you have increased fat, you're gonna have increased cholesterol levels, increased cholesterol levels, increase your risk of hypertension, increase risk of hypertension, increase your risk of heart attacks. So eating these things are fine. I love a piece of red meat every once in a while, but I do eat a lot of chicken, I do eat a lot of fish, and I eat, just try to eat as many fresh fruits and vegetables as possible. I think in general, we all know what to eat. We tend to trick ourselves into thinking that we can eat something on a regular basis that may not be that healthy, but it's just, eat just a good diet. You can, everything in moderation is fine. But eating a big porterhouse steak every night, maybe not a good idea, not necessarily from a prostate cancer perspective, maybe not necessarily from a colon cancer perspective, probably from a heart perspective. Um, so just eat a uh, varied diet and, and, you know, it's just common sense. It's just common sensical, healthy lifestyle, including exercise. Yes, please. We have no evidence to we have no evidence to um, to to back it up or to to say yes or no. Sorry, but once again it is uh, once again it's a commonsensical approach to a healthy diet and healthy lifestyle. Any other questions? Great, I think we ran out of questions. Thank you so much. Well, this concludes our formal program. We'd like to thank all the doctors, Sydney, Jean, thank you guys for coming. The bags on the table, you guys can take those. But I think if you have more questions for the doctors, they'll hang around for maybe 10 more minutes to answer any more questions you might have. Thank you again. It was a great event. Did you guys learn something? Learn something?